Today we're going to talk about uh, something a little different, but it's related to comic books, but also literature, uh, games, movies, TV, really any anything with a story. But we're going to talk about it from the perspective of setting um, and, and world building. And really it's about the concept of the world outside your window. And if you don't know what that means, it's uh, basically substituting a, an elaborate, an elaborate uh, artificial setting for basically placing your characters and stories in a world that's more or less identical to uh, the, the, the world outside your window, the r real life, in other words. And we're going to talk about that in, in comparison to uh, developing a more fully realized setting and some, some benefits and drawbacks to it. And we're going to offer our thoughts on what we like and what we, we don't like about that and what um, and sort of the, 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 the story, the realization of stories that this allows. So um, I, I guess I'll lead off in saying that um, I am not a fan of the world outside your window. And it, it's, we generally see it, of course, in um, generic non-genre non literature. And it's, uh, you know, romance story. It's, it's, you know, obviously there are exceptions, but, you know, romance stories and uh, slice of life kind of things. Um, but... You, you do see it, uh, and I don't see I don't see a problem with it there. Where I see a problem with it um, is when it, it becomes adapted to uh, a fantastic setting. And I think uh, notably we see this in the the major American superhero comic universes, which are to one extent or another world outside your window. DC much less so than Marvel, um, but. Marvel in particular in that, you know, they have the cities are the same, the, you know, they'll have Spider-Man meeting with Barack Obama on, on the cover. Um, and, and, you know, the president, whoever is the president at the time is the president in the book, nine 11 happens and, um, and all this other uh, stuff. And I yep, was going to say not nine 11 is actually, I think the best example of the, the problems with the world outside your window. Um, and that was that, uh, you know, obviously 9-11 occurred in real life. And then they had the Marvel superheroes responding to the aftermath of it as opposed to actually responding to it. And, you know, for right. a, a group of people that could, you know, uh, save, galaxies from save galaxies from Galactus, you know, uh, de defeat the Emkron crystal and save reality and everything like that to, to think that a second plane would hit a building when they know that plane number one has hit a building. And then a third, you know, and then a fourth. Uh, and uh, yes, exactly. So we, I, I guess maybe we'll just get right into the meat, meat and potatoes of, of why, why I don't like this format, um, which, which may be uh, a bit un, unfair and, and prejudice people to, to using it. But, um, you know, the example of 9-11, they, and they made a big deal about it. They had like 9-11 editions of, of Marvel Comics. And, um, but a terrorist plot on the scale of, of the September 11th attacks happens routinely in the Marvel universe. It's nothing to get excited about. It's something that any number of superheroes, you know, could take care of without, without breaking a sweat. Um, as you, as you say, even if they missed the first plane, they would have done something about the, the other three. And, um, in, so th this, this is, this is where the fantastic, um, the fantastic premises of the setting and of the story and other characters really collides with the, with doing the world world uh, outside your window. Um, you know, I, I don't think you saw the same problems to the same extent in DC who, you know, with their Gotham city and their metropolis and their, you know, Lex Luthor's president or whoever at the time, right. It's a, it's a different world. So that they didn't feel, I guess that they had to, to incorporate this into the Marvel universe. Whereas, um, or, or sorry, in, into the DC universe, whereas, whereas Marvel did. Um, and I think it made, it really wrecks the, um, the sense of continuity. It doesn't seem to make sense anymore. And go back to what uh, Ardenon said in, in previous um, conversations, that the, the, the head canon that we build up around um, these heroes and the world they live in. So I, I don't know, what, what, do you got, what do you guys think about that? Do you agree with me or is, um, are, are you more or less okay with that kind of setting or?
Um, I think, like, I mean, it's just one of those things where you you can pause and think of like a million ways that that they could have stopped it. So it it doesn't make sense. And even things like, you know, uh, it's horrible that it happened, obviously, but like, how is wrecking a building? using a plane in the Marvel universe, any different than Dr. Doom launching an entire building <laughs> with tenants and employees into space. Because he actually did do that. Uh, so the Dr. Doom famously launched the Baxter building into space in an early fantastic four issue. Um, but the you're, you're, you're right too. I mean the, the, as far as we're, we're talking about like the destructiveness uh, of, of the, of, of the slaughter there, as bad as it was in the real world um, in, in the again in the Marvel universe, it, not such a big event. I mean, New York has been really wrecked whole whole neighborhoods many, many times. The you know, if you, if you believe the if the if the original nineteen thirties nineteen forties Marvel comics are um, from from timely are still in continuity there, the Submariner had flooded New York with this huge tidal wave. Uh, I'm sure there was uh, a lot of other damage from. The, the various alien invasions they've had um, and they and they, they they try they you know it's interesting that that they that they went with that in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe they actually they made a big deal about the the invasion um, in that happened in the Avengers movie and then they kept they referred to that that was the stand-in instead of 9/11 in the in the Netflix series like Daredevil they call it the incident or the event or whatever they called it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I actually thought that was intelligent, which is not to say that it didn't happen, either, that 9 11 didn't happen either. But you know, you, you get into wondering why that, so that besides that, the, the main problem that I see with uh, the world outside your window in a, in a, in a fantastic context is that you know, you very quickly have no explanation for why things are continuing the way they are. Right there, there's no particular reason that um, for instance, that the wars in Afghanistan or, or Iraq would have happened. There's there's no there's no reason that that say Barack Obama or Donald Trump would have been elected um, in, in the Marvel universe with all the other things going on. Right? There's um, especially if you believe that the other stuff going on there like um, when the Red Skull was uh, pretending to be the Secretary of Defense or Secretary of State or whatever it was, or when Tony Stark was Secretary of State, uh, under under whose administration were they in, and, and why and why is why is that allowed to be different? But and all these other things happen. You're you're fighting with Doctor Doom at the UN and and arguing with the Wakanda and all this other stuff. But everything else happens exactly the, the same way. And I think you have a real real problem. Um, not suspending disbelief, if you if you have to deal with that, um, and and say that every, everything was, was was just the same. Um, okay, um, actually, I I agree uh, with much of what you're saying here, and I I think the the biggest flag for me is not even so much comic books, but I'll I'll dive over into um, writing, uh, into into novels. Um, science fiction specifically hard science fiction bef uh, as opposed to science fantasy or pulp whatever you'd like to call it um, the, the challenge for me writing reading something that is identified and and really is hard science fiction is I can't believe it um, this is this is um, a, a subgenre that says I'm only gonna take the, the reality that we know today, and I'm going to make use of it, although I may throw in just one little tweak, just mm -hmm. one little distortion, just one little pretend thing that we don't know, but, but may exist in the future. It, in some respects, that is the, in my mind, the opposite end of the spectrum from what you're describing, Mike, Shell, mm -hmm. when you're saying, Oh well, here's the Marvel Universe, but we'll make them respond to real events in our universe. I don't see any difference. It, in my mind, if you're going to have a fantastic story, you have to have a fantastic world. 
it's got to be r- rational. It's got to have consequences. It's got to be able to have characters that grow and change and respond to the events and the consequences that they experience. But hard science fiction, uh, okay, I can't have uh, a star drive. Um, okay, not a problem. We'll have events that happen between Mars and the moon and Earth. And in most cases, those events are going to be as dull and dry and boring as reality out your window. Because it'll, it'll be a lot of the stuff that we do in every day existing peppered with a couple of quick events that have consequences and okay, well, um, I'm not reading your book to watch the events that are occurring outside my window. I I think that's Mm. my other, my other issue here. If, if I'm looking for entertainment, this is only me, but if I'm looking for entertainment, I I want more of the fantastic. Uh, I, I don't have a problem with star drive. I don't have a problem with force shields. I don't have a problem with, with, planet splitting bombs that that couldn't exist in 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 reality that physics says are impossible i'm okay with that as long as you're entertaining me as long as you're telling me a good story as long as i can believe the characters um have a reason for what they're doing uh they they have that right as you've alluded to mike head cannon yeah you, you bring up a good point that i wasn't i wasn't really thinking about um but you 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 have the problem of when you adapt the world outside your window as, as your setting, whether it, it's conscious or subconscious, you stop wanting to do things in your story and with your characters that would have an effect and, and dramatically alter the world outside your window anymore. And, and so I, I think um, be, beyond what you're saying, if, especially if you're limiting to, um, you're limiting to the, uh, the things that are really possible or that you think, think are plausible, uh, and and they may not necessarily be particularly exciting. You're you're also uh, as you go down the road, you're saying you're, hey, hey I can't um, I can't have my character do anything really uh, exceptional or, or have the story have too big consequences. Otherwise, it would have a, a cascading effect on the rest of society. It would affect politics. It might affect economics. You know, for instance, if if you if you did develop a a star drive or a teleporter or, or or not even that but even on like a much smaller scale there uh, say you're you know you're you're like a in a mac bolin sort of of world where you know you're you're basically normal men with with guns and they're or secret agents mm-hmm. james bond kind of thing um but you know if the things in the james bond movie really happened you know with all the big explosions and like a, a, a near a nearly started war between china and the uk like in that um, I forget which movie that was, but that the, the, the television news guy was trying to architect this um, or with like um, the Moonraker space station, that, that stuff would uh, affect, um, you, you couldn't say, oh, well, it just happened. And then two days later, everybody forgot about it and things went right. on exactly the way they were. It, it, and I think that once you do that, you start second guessing yourself and maybe it encourages you to maybe uh, take less risks and, and make, your story more boring because you don't want to create those situations where that happens. Right. And I, I think that's the challenge that, that any creator, especially writers are, are going to be faced with is at, at some point you're going to introduce an event that's going to have a significant impact and a permanent impact on the characters in your story. It might be one or two of the characters that might be half the world know about something that changed their way of thinking or reacting to the world around them. I'll go back to the X-Men. Okay, let's let's pull that one out. Um, if I had a if I had a team of of, of five superpowered mutants run by a, a person who could read minds and left the wake of destruction they did in the first 65 issues of their comic book, I'm wondering if the United States wouldn't ask for them to be registered, put in cages, ensure that they don't reproduce, a lot of different things. Or, or force there, them to reproduce on the flip yeah, side. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. There, there could be a, any number of ramifications for seeing these individuals display these abilities or create that kind of destruction. I, in the Marvel Universe, I have, uh, you know, I have no problem with the government saying, you know what? All of you clowns, 
we're going to register you or we'll put you in cages or something just as draconian because you are so dangerous, you're so destructive, we can't live around you. Right. And, and it certainly makes, whether you like agree with it or not, you'd say that they would, you would expect them to do that you'd, um, because it would, it would actually be unrealistic if all they did was just the status quo, nothing ever changes. Right. Um, you, you would expect them to do something like that. But that, you, you know, you didn't exactly uh, allude to this, but um, you reminded me of one, one of my pet peeves that you some often saw in comics, probably less so today, but certainly in the, the 80s and 90s, especially when a writer wanted to make a joke. Um, is you'd run into somebody on the street um, where they didn't believe superheroes were real, <laughs> and and like they and it wasn't just somebody in like uh, Upper Lower Overshoe, Nebraska. It was somebody in New York. He, they lived in Manhattan, and and often you know they would th th this joke would come while Spider Man and Green Goblin are punching out ab above them, and then uh, you know over over on the docks. There's an Atlantean army invading and everything, but they they don't believe it. Uh, in fact, like there there was the one issue of Fantastic Four in the '80s when Terax rebels against Galactus and he he poisons Galactus and steals his cosmic power and to dem just to show off he lifts Manhattan off the like he lifts the, the whole of Manhattan off the Earth. Um, and then there's there's people there talking about like like they don't even notice it and that it didn't happen and no, nobody comments on it that even though the bridges and power and everything were cutting the hand wave and that oh galactus put it back just to show how much powerful he was that there was no damage and everything but like they it, it went and it had zero effect on anybody right um, and and i i and i know they're funny books with with people wearing you know long underwear and they have superpowers but you, they they do they do occasionally ask you to take these stories seriously, and that's that's one of the cases right there where where you simply cannot do it anymore. Exactly, and I I think that's that's the challenge you've got when you're trying to continually trying to push our reality or you know quote unquote reality into something that's a fantastic thing to begin with. Um, it has its own kind of reality and continuity. And when you try to mix those things, I, I, I think you end up finding a discontinuity that you cannot resolve. Or if you do resolve it, it tends to be a resolution that's unpalatable to the reader. So, so let me throw out, because um, we, we, we seem to all have, uh, we're all in agreement on this, but is, is, it, is it possible to write some kind of, um, a, a somewhat, at least somewhat more fantastic story? That, that does have the, the world out, outside your window. And let me throw out um, a couple examples that I, I was thinking of where I think this might be successful. Um, the most obvious to me is the, uh, the occult detective genre, the, the ghost punchers. Um, usually these take place, um, you could talk about classic ones like Karnacki or Dr. Heselius and all the way up to um, Harry Dresden. Mm -hmm. But they typically take place in the real world. There's, there's, um, they they may use magic or psychic abilities, but um, they don't. Um, and which is not to say they necessarily establish like this is who's president, this is the year it's in, this is the city, and so forth. But they they generally have real world settings and real world attitudes, and and it is a cult in the sense that, um, in the literal Latin sense of the word, where it's hidden, people don't 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 know it. I mean, could, is it? Does does the world outside your window work in in a, in a case like that? Uh, I think the and I uh, I need to remember I I wanted to give an example of something that works even even better than that, but um, oh well, go ahead, go ahead. Well, let me uh, answer your direct question first. Um, I I think world outside your window works to the breaking off point. Okay, like. Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, or I should say the divergence point. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, you you can have the world outside your window not knowing about it, whatever it is. Like if it's uh, magic uh, came back in the year 1900 or something, and there's been this secret cabal. It's like, well, if you actually establish that they have remained secret, then uh, I suppose you can do it. And I'll give my example of what I think works really well for that. But I think you could also do it. You can have something set today and just have, uh, you know, one thing. Like I'll uh, talk about why the last man. 
where they just suddenly have one day in uh, you know our reality, uh, all the men on Earth are killed except for one. Um, and it's like, well, that that's if your divergence point is today, then yes, you can do world outside your window with one divergence point because uh, everything that's going to change is going to be ahead of you. Um, it's but, essentially a, a break point in real in in what we know as reality. It, it's right. a new reality after that. Um, right. So, but, so you're you're talking you're you're applying the concept of the point of divergence, which you usually talk about in the context of an alternate history. That history happened as we know it up until this point. Then this this right. counterfactual proposition happened, and it and it went off on a different branch. Right. So if that's today, then it's world outside your window with one with one thing and it's happening today. So you, you create the divergent po divergence point in your story. And in that case it works. Um, but much more than that, I think the best example of that, and I, I haven't, um, I'm surprised you haven't brought it up is Tim powers. Um, Tim powers. Well, I, takes... I, I, I was going to bring up a couple of Tim power stories, but okay. Cause the, the big thing with Tim powers is that he takes uh, somewhat, uh, you know, real life things that actually happened, like uh, war is an event, like, you know, uh, he, he covers the Cold War and he covers, uh, I'm so bad with history. Let's talk about Declare then in, in, in particular, because what you're talking about here, um, uh, so Declare is a novel about, among other things, um, Kim Philby, who was a, a, a British trader who was a double agent in British intelligence, but he was working for the Soviets for a long time. And it's about his su sort of supernatural half brother, um, who is uh, an agent working for the British intelligence and this long simmering plot to, um, to undermine what was originally a Russian empire, supernatural, uh, force multiplier that then transferred into the hand hands of the, of, of, of the Bolsheviks. Um, but, in many ways, uh, it's it, it's a it's a horror novel. It's a sort of Catholic um, supernatural mystery spy suspense novel, and it's great. It's it's one of my favorite books. So, I, if you're listening and you haven't read it, and, you, and it sounds like that's the kind of thing you're you're into, you should you should definitely check it out. But um, uh, what it, what it really ultimately is is a, is a super is positing a supernatural explanation for why the Soviet Union lasted as long as it did and why it suddenly fell in 1989, um, and it, it, as Shell says, it has the complete veneer of historical truth, except for the, you know, a couple of the, um, the, the point of view characters. Um, most of the other, the, the other, uh, the, many of the other important characters are real people. The events happened in the real order in which they did, aside from a couple of things like the mission to Mount Ararat and stuff like that. But it, it, it follows their trajectory through before World War II and through World War II and into the 1960s. Um, but like the, the events happened, it even ties back into like Lawrence of Arabia and the stuff he did for like British intelligence during World War One, And like all those, uh, all those personalities, the, the, they were, were really at the places they were at the times, times he said they were in. Uh, and yet, yet it, um, there is this whole other completely um, very esoteric, very, um, if the world found out about it, it would, it would really shake the foundations of, of reality, um, uh, at least in our cultural reality with society and government and everything. Um, but uh, he, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a good example of something he does pull off, but is, is that a little different than the world outside your window? Um, because um, I don't know. I know. I, I, I guess it does work. And I, and I think that's part of one of the reasons why I brought it up in the example of like the occult detectives where um, if, if things are hidden and they don't ever become uh, public knowledge, public knowledge right. if they don't, if you don't have this big explosion where cities are wiped out, if, if Galactus isn't shown on the, on the TV news, you can, you can get away with, with doing that. But um, that brings you to the point that if, you know, you as the writer, as the storyteller, uh, again, it's if you're okay with that. If if you if you if you set up with that premise and you're like, I want to keep it that way, you're you're again uh, you're limiting yourself and you're saying I can never go in this direction. Uh, for instance, you know, there's there's a lot of um, uh, 
more, more so in the late nineties and early two thousands than now, but the, 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 the conspiracy genre was big. Um, the, you know, you had games like Delta green games, like conspiracy X, you had like the area 51 novels that all the stuff about alien contact and Atlantis and all this other stuff. And, and you know, they, they were, it was all very entertaining, but if they were all set with the, with the premise of this, this is the, this is the real world. Um, so if you, if you set that and you commit yourself to that, you're never able then to you you've written yourself in the corner like you can never have the aliens reveal themselves you can never have bigfoot captured but and some of that happen on tv and um in 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 pulp and it's been successful to some extent um if you've if you read the the destroyer books is that the goal is is never that Remo and Chun are are known. It, they're always working behind the scenes, or working underground, or or working in disguise, enact some activity, some event that stops, you know, a bad guy, and they're never supposed to be discovered. So it, it's kind of the it's kind of the the the, the thrust of the story is. Remo's doing his activities and he's never supposed to be discovered. Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always work, but um, <laughs> uh, the, the old TV show UFO. Yep. Uh, where um, hunted by these aliens who were landing and he was hunting them and he would never have enough evidence or never have any evidence left in hand to prove to anybody these creatures have landed. And it have. Uh, the TV series or the movie in some respects is the same way. There, there's a, there's a, a drive to show a secret or hide a secret that, yeah, you're, you, you can, but as long as you recognize, here's how long I can play in the real world before I have the event that changes everything. It's a great world to play in. Mm -hmm. You bring up UFO. And I think in the second or third episode of that series, there's that, um, I think he's a commercial test pilot or something, and he sees the UFO, um, and he, he sees the UFO team intercept it. And then they, they um, you know, he keeps investigating, and he basically almost blows the lid off their whole operation. Um, but but then, like, they, they have to, they sort of have to force or convince him to join them to, to keep it quiet. And, yeah, I, I think that, um, I, I actually think that can make good story, story fodder. But I think, again, that, in a sense, is still, it's still a cult fiction. It's a cult in the literal sense because it, it's hidden, and and you have to you're going to have to commit to that. Right. But but I think it's this is where Shell was going. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Shell. But I, I think that you know the old style definition of romance, really, where everything that we write or, or create in fiction is is part of the old romance genre. The split off to gothic, uh, the split off to horror. Many of those genres are the real genre. You're you're writing in that the reader in most cases suspects or believes I'm living in the real world that I see around me every day. But then there's these events, whether they're supernatural um, or 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 just have an apparent supernatural nature, reveals something that's been hidden about the reality we live in. It may not be shown to anybody else, but it at least changes that character mm -hmm. uh, in their perception of what reality is. So again, we're 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 in the real world, but now we've taken the character and expanded or or frightened them to death uh, about what reality actually is. That's a interesting point to uh, in light of something that we watched recently. Um, Dark Shadows, which is my my the only soap opera I've I've ever watched, but I, I like it quite. It's a the bit. only soap opera worth watching, right? Um, but we, we just watched a documentary on it, um, and of course, if anybody knows that, so so Dark Shadows for those who don't know was a 1960s through early 1970s soap opera. Um, it was on you know ABC in the daytime, and um, it, it started as sort of like a, a more suspenseful one, but it, it didn't have it just but not supernatural. And it was about to go off the air. They started introducing all the supernatural elements, ghosts and the phoenix and then the, the, the 
of uh, a vampire and werewolves and Frank. It's that, that they went the whole nine yards. They eventually did almost everything you could think of. Um, but except mummies, except mummies. Yes. As the, as the guy in the documentary brought up, he said the mummies were the only thing they didn't do. Um, but uh, that that's, they, I, I was, that's actually, uh, in my opinion, like that, that's, that's a, that's the counterpoint to the world outside your window. They tried to do it and, and they, they tried to do, it's just, you know, the normal, uh, mystery and suspense that can happen in these everyday circumstances, but then they they um, there's a point when they were thinking about doing the ghost and stuff, and Dan Curtis, the executive producer, was like, "We have to try something. We're going to go off the air, so let's do this." And in the documentary, and I forget what I forget what the documentary is called. So I'll find Masters of was it Masters of Dark Masters Shadows? of Dark Shadows. Okay, so we'll we'll put the link up there in the description, but the, the, one of the he writers said to Dan Curtis, he's like, you know, if we do this, we can't go back. Um, you know, and they end up doing it. They were successful for a number of years, but that, that goes, um, that, that goes back to, to what we're saying that, you know, once, once you make that leap. And I th think that me, that's be one of those things that frightens people. Um, I, I, and I think a lot of people have this, a lot of writers have this fear of, of doing world building because they or or like a, a very different setting because maybe they're overwhelmed by it maybe they they their only experience with it is J.R. Tolkien and they're like God I can't invent my own fictional elven languages right. and I, I can't come up with with fourteen thousand years of history going back through before humans existed and all this sort of stuff um, I'm sorry were you going to say something Sean I was going to say for like that that's the big thing about it is that it's hard it's really hard. And it's, it, it can be just as hard to try to, um, it can be just as hard to change something and go forward with it and try to see where that goes as it is in like, you know, writing uh, historical things. Like if, if you don't research, I mean, I'll, I'll say it right out. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer who uh, back when I was in college, how many years ago was I in college? <laughs> 15 years. 15 years ago when I was in college, you know, I, I wrote a uh, medieval fantasy story where the kids were in school. <laughs> it's like, uh oh, and someone pointed school. out. Uh, yes. I, I, I was like, what well, wasn't I the only the first person to point that out to you years after? No, you no, no. There was oh, okay. uh, there was a kid in the class that was like uh, schools didn't exist back then yeah, the way they do now. Worked. And uh, yeah, and it's like you. You know, that that was my big smack in the face during writing where it's like if you try to do anything out of the ordinary, uh, you you have to research it and you have to think about it. And it's like, well, uh, well but ho hold on. I, I would I would say that you 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 were actually trying to write a uh, world outside your window, but put it in the in a medieval context. And it, right. Fact, which that, doesn't that work in your face. Right. Uh, um, because it w by by the counter example, um, you know, in, in our in our our Martian war books, the Population Loss, uh, Days of Wrath, the, the forthcoming book, um, books which are set in in, in the late 18, 1890s, um, people ha have generally commented and said, "Boy, I really really like the writing style. It reads like a book of that era. Your your technical descriptions are correct. Your um, the way people live is is correct." Um, and and they they I get compliments like that on them. And, and they say, when are you going to write more? And I'm like, I, I actually have a hard time writing those stories because it's it's a hell of a lot of work researching that and, and getting that right. Um, right. But so I think it's it's easier to abandon the world outside your window. And and yes, you you have to come up with all kinds of other stuff. But um, if you've ever if you're writing, um, like I was saying, like a historical science fiction piece or something like that, um, or, or or even like today you're talking about to get in now you, things you're familiar with like your car and your computer and the kind of cell phone you have okay but once you start getting into you know let's, let's say you're writing um an, an action adventure novel now you start talking about your attack helicopters or, or or how fast would this transport plane be able to get them here and i have this tight deadline and they have to be able to fly from from Andrews Air Force Base and do a, a airdrop over over Yemen or something is like how long will it take to get there and and can they make it in one trip and, and what's and all of a sudden you're now now you're trying to find out the fuel capacity of of a certain mil military a transport plane and and its range and um it's very daunting 
so I, I think in in comparison um, to say a fantasy setting where where um, teleporters or light speed or, or or even if you're talking like like a a, a Tolkien medieval or, or older fantasy, it's like well let's just go to this area and this this piece of geographic terrain um, it looks exactly as I described it and no one can go to this place and 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 say that you know this house wasn't here or you know if, if you're trying to write a lovecraft pastiche and you're trying to write about the way providence looked in the 1920s like you have no idea and and uh and i guess in that case not too many people can can gainsay you on that either but um but it's oh it's, someone uh, will there, there's it's, always one person who will yeah there, there's one guy who's like 97 years old that still reads that stuff and but yeah it, it's it's actually um um any anything is hard to do right anything is hard to do well so um but i i would say of the two things inventing uh um a, a fictional world from whole cloth well is easier than writing a piece of an exciting piece of fiction in in a like very historically accurate world Well, I'm not certain I completely agree. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out there because I think based on, let's just, re, let's just focus on people who've, who've done something and, and taken a split off from history and said, here's where it goes. That is Mike, you and Shell. What have you done with your books is you've said, well, at, at some point in history, you don't know where that point is or multiple points in history, We've had a divergence in what we know as Earth's history and the present day. Different things have happened. Timelines have moved forward. You've taken, and I, I know you guys are still doing this. You'll you'll do research on. So what was that? What was the 19th century like? What was the what was the beginning of the 20th century like? What what if I had, uh, the, you know, this scientific principle turned out to be true? And what would be the implications? You can still put yourself in a situation where it's very challenging to write a believable story, even if you took it to the point of it being pure fantasy. And I'll argue that from the perspective of what, what we've already talked about before. It's got to be internally consistent. It's mm -hmm. got to have consequences. It's got to be believable. And in, in my mind, it's got to be fun. I've got to be entertained. Not so much that I'm going to gloss over stuff, but it's written well enough that I am engrossed in that story and I don't have something that kicks me out of it. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to argue with a, with a compliment like that, but um, <laughs> yeah. And, and it, like I said, it, it's, it's work. Any, anything you do is, is, um, to make something believable in a fantastic setting is inherently hard. Um, but there, I would say someone who wanted to write a world based on um, public domain fiction and saying that, the, you know, everything from 20,000 leagues under the sea to a princess of Mars, to the war of the worlds, to the Avengers of Sherlock Holmes, um, to, um, <clears throat> the hp lovecraft dream cycle actually happened in reality um and and say and and build a history out of that um probably does not have to go into the extent that that we th that we have and um you you could write depending on the kind of stories you're writing you could gloss over a lot and you can dr just drop hints um you can mm -hmm. hang a hang a lampshade on it as a lot, lot of authors who write that kind of material do um and you may get more or less satisfaction on that now personally that doesn't go far enough for me and and i'm i become more interested in the in the the hints that they drop and the connections to other things um but <clears throat> uh, i i think it, it it depends on you know if, if you want to be tolkien if you want to make this whole world um if you want to come up with things that the average reader uh, wouldn't even think to ask if you want to come up with the answers to that. Yes, that that requires uh, an awful lot of work. But um, uh, a lot, I I actually get offended that that a lot of readers don't think to ask me questions about <laughs> ab about some of these things that happen because I'd love to explain them, but I don't think anybody really cares. 
I think, though, too, like, how to put it? Uh, I think that there's something to be said that I think one of the reasons the the Ascension Epoch is as balanced as it is, is that Mike and I oppose each other on some things. So sometimes we end up meeting in the middle of it. Um, one of my things is I'm, uh, I'm very bad with history and I'm, uh, you know, I, I do as much research as I can, but sometimes I, I get completely stuck, but, uh, I try to stay character focused. If you, for example, if you, uh, write from, uh, like a single character's perspective, uh, they're not going to see a lot of the bigger things. So, you know, that that's one way that you can, um, you know, keep it simpler or write around it because you only have to worry about what one character knows. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and from another, as, as opposed to, to getting into multiple characters' heads as the as the story progresses, you move back and forth between a couple of different or many different individuals. Right. Um, you know, so so if you and especially if that character is being hunted or cut off or something like that in some other way. Um, they, they may only get snippets and I think, uh, you know, snippets or hints of what's going on, uh, can be just as effective if you're, uh, you know, trying to throw things in there, but not trying to explain everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think there's, um, you know, there, there's some media lately that, uh, well, not lately, there always is, um, where there there doesn't seem to be too much thought put into how things are happening or um you know i i have a million uh a million like the last season of, of game of thrones for instance where they're seemingly uh teleporting around the world they're covering hundreds or, or thousands of miles in distance in in a, in a few hours or days which right. would simply be impossible or or for that matter the second and third hobbit movies where they do that right um or like, you know, uh, changing battle tactics in the latest Star Wars. And it's like, well, if you could do that, then you'd just be, you know, hyperdriving ships under shields all the time and blowing things up. Mm -hmm.